Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, also, a special welcome to those of, uh, of you joining us online. My name is Gunjan, and I work at the Sussex School of Education and Social Work at the Centre for International Education. And I am absolutely delighted to be chairing this lecture today. Um, we have two very special speakers I'm going to introduce uh, in a second. We have Professors Bureid Dunn and Professor Barbara Koswa. Professor Murray Dunn is a professor of sociology of education at the University of Sussex, working in the Center for International Education. Her research has focused on educational and social differences through micro level studies of the intersecting and overlapping social relations. Murray has also lived and worked in several countries in the global north and global south, which has highlighted for her the sustained work of education in the reproduction and valorization of particular privileged colonial Western knowledges that need to be addressed urgently in efforts toward greater global equity. An important detail to mention here is that Marie was also my PhD supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's an achievement. Yeah. <laughs> <Tiny> Yours. <laughs> um, we also have Professor Barbara Kroswa, and Barbara is a professor of theory in education. Her research and teaching is focused on education and the production of identities, in particular, the intersections of gender with other axes of identity. Um, it is important, significant for me to mention that both Marie and Barbara's research is informed through post-colonial feminist, post-structuralist and decolonial studies to engage critically with the field of international education and development and how this continues to be informed by modern neocolonial imperatives. So thank you to both of you for joining us today. And um, the lecture today is on exploring the nexus of gender, liberalism and development. Barbara and Marie are going to present for about 40 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. And then um, we'll have five minutes of what we call the Sussex buzz and we'll open it up for um, Q and A. So, over to you, Marie the Yeah. Oh, no, I've got this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, in this double act, I'm going to start off. Barbara's going to come in with the hard stuff in the middle, and I'm going to finish <laughs> off. So, um, um, it's great to see you all here. It's great to see people online. Thank you for coming. I think you can be grateful for not being too near to me because, as you can tell by my voice, I'm not quite uh, uh, okay in my vocal passages, shall we say. Let's leave it there. Um, okay, so what we're going to do then today is um, I'm going to provide the overview of this session is that I'm going to set the scene. Um, just so we have a common understanding of where we're coming from. Um, and then uh, we're going to turn to liberalism and do a, an archaeological exploration of liberalism, um, looking particularly at the social contract and the subject citizen. We'll then look at exclusions in terms of gender, race, plus, plus, plus. Turn to looking at technologies of power and the production of gender. Refer back to the liberal lexicon of development, and then think about reshaping the nexus of gender, liberalism, and development. Okay. So we're starting with a great quote from Escobar, and uh, he says, without examining development as discourse, we cannot understand the systemic, systematic ways in which the Western developed countries have been able to manage and control and in many ways, even create the third world politically, economically, sociologically, and culturally. Okay, so let's um, let's um, 
bear that in mind that we have to examine development as a discourse. And what, what I'm going to do now, as I say, is just get a common ground, giving things. I'm not expecting you to read the little table in the top, but it will be reminiscent for people who are, who are in development what this is about. Um, we're referring here to the Human Development Index, which is a critical uh, way of understanding development. Uh, and we have, through that table and its indices, we have um, uh, the Human Development Index. This Human Development Index is calculated by looking at indicators such as uh, life expectancy, expected years of schooling, mean years of schooling, and GNI, gross national income. These are all computed and you get a number, which is the Human Development Index, and you get countries listed by that. Um, importantly for us as people who come from education, out of those four indicators, two of them are about education. Um, so this Human Development Index is calculated and nation states are ranked in hierarchies and we have those who are described as having very high uh, national development, those with high, those with medium, and those with low human development. And anybody who's ever been in touch uh, with those indicators uh, will probably look at the country they're most interested in or come from and look at how they rank. Interestingly, um, if we go to look at gender now, because we're looking at the nexus of gender and development, there. There is um, a gender development in, in index, which simply takes the human development index and disaggregates it by gender. But then there is also the human inequality index. Um, and again, when they calculate the gender inequality index, they don't do anything to the hierarchy and they list the rank of nations. They just add another column that says something about the gender inequality index. This um, index includes maternal mortality rate, share of seats in parliament, population with at least some secondary education, this will get disaggregated male and female, and labor force participation, again, disaggregated male and female. In, in this index, education is one of those five me measures. So if we're looking at the whole field of development, uh, we know that education is integral to measures of development. Um, and in the SDGs, we're just pointing to two relevant ones here. Um, we have got uh, goal four, which is about um, quality education. And it really is um, one of the main rationalizations for education is related to uh, human capital theory. Human capital theory uh, suggests to us that we should invest heavily in education. And it has an uh, impact on the development of a country. We also have um, gender goals. G uh, education is a key vector for gender empowerment and equality. So in both of these goals, you'll see reference to gender as part of the normal discussion of how development goes on. We'll come back to this. Um, and I've got a quote here by Moore. And he says, the purpose of education in advanced industrial society was to facilitate progressive social change by educating citizens for productive, fulfilling lives in affluent, meritocratic, open societies based on the rational application of science and technology to economic and social life. So we can see that link between education and development, which is also related to economics. Uh, human capital theory itself is about uh, national economics and, and it's about uh, individual and national economics. However, we are in different times now. These times in kind of post Second World War era produced a, a kind of communitarian feel in, in many countries. And at this time, when many countries of the global south achieved independence, uh, this was really important, this rolling out of the importance of development, education for development. Um, okay, 
But now we're in a new era. We're in an era of globalization and neoliberalism. And what that means is that old, old ideas of the relationship between uh, citizens and state changed. And globalization and neoliberalism kind of rolled in together are talking about increased global in interconnectivity and acceleration and intensification of communications. I think we all have experienced that. And um, um, an intensification, acceleration of uh, exchange, exchanges, transactions. Importantly, these social, political and economic activities of exchange have gone across what we might think of as national borders. And this has changed the social contract between states and their citizens. Um, giving a little quote from Nagar, re research has linked globalization to the historically specific post-1989 um, hegemony of neoliberal discourse that is reworking nation state power and the rhetorics and practices of development. Global institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank have reframed debates over development in terms of a neoliberal doctrine and are opening economies around the world for the freer flow of capital and commodities. Okay. However, what we see in, in this uh, neoliberal era is a, something that comes from the NDP itself that says, with all these promises of greater economic productivity, more educated people, what we have here is, for the first time on record, the global HDI, Human Development Indicate Index Value, declined, taking the world back to a time just after the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement. Last year saw some recovery at the global level, but it was partial and uneven. Most very high HDI countries notched improvements while most of the rest experienced ongoing declines. So currently, I would say, I've come from a history and I'm bringing you into now. Currently, I would say that neoliberalism uh, is, is a, a target for lots of critique for those people who are interested in development globally. And, and the critiques of neoliberalism refer to its presentation as inevitable. It's almost nothing could stop it. It's inevitable. It's a fait accompli. Um, and this in itself obscures the politics that conceal the political and conceal its normative values and assumptions. Which, so we don't raise questions about it because it is presented as a kind of obvious, natural next step. Importantly, as the description of neoliberalism suggests, it has eroded the capacities of the state and its relations to its citizens. There are ways in which the state has less, than, less control than it was imagined in a previous era. It reduces all social life to market values. It is in economic theory, after all. Its global perspective makes invisible the local social relations and inequalities. It is a macro level perspective. And importantly for us, its assumptions are of the self-interested individual subject. So in this process of the move to uh, neoliberalism, we have an idea of the subject as self-interested -interest and individual. Have a tea, Do you want to take this? Yeah, fine. Have you so, got a... oh, yeah, I need a, <laughs> just a switch. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Yeah, super. So having done that setting of the ground, what we want to highlight is our central focus here is on the understandings of the subject um, that were um, uh, Marie just pointed to. Yeah, um, our interests are in gender, and these are, that has raised questions about the assumptions of the subject and the understandings of the subject in development discourses. Um, so education, as Maria has highlighted, is used as an indicator of and a vector for development. 
Um, but yeah, our research interests are in the work of education and in the production of identities and of the subject. Yeah. Um, within the intensified focus on neoliberalism that we've just identified, we wanted to interrogate the assumptions of the subject that's within that, but to trace the emergence of those understandings in liberal thought. And our argument is that education, gender and development are all shot through with liberal assumptions. Um, and importantly, that involves assumptions of the subject uh, that are liberal, uh, but are gendered, raced, classed, etc., cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I'm now going to uh, turn to the concept of liberalism and talk a bit about that. Yeah. So liberalism refers to a constellation of ideas and principles associated with the age of modernity or the age of enlightenment, um, two terms that uh, both used to describe the same period, that emerged from 18th century century Europe onwards. And uh, some of its central tenets were um, that this involved a challenge to traditional authority, yeah? um, the end of absolute divine monarchy, the idea that men could actually, men could actually rule, choose their own ruler, yeah? It was a period which saw the emergence of modern science. We'll come back to that. Centrally, it involved a focus on individual freedom. Yeah. And this all involved a new and produced a new understanding of the subject, of the individual. Yeah. And it reformulated the relationship between the individual and society. And this was integral to the emergence of the modern capitalist state. Yeah. So how was this new relationship conceptualized between the individual and the state? Our argument here is central to this, um, was that this new relationship was conceptualized through the notion of a social contract. So the liberal subject entering into a social contract with the state was assumed importantly to be autonomous agentic, rational, that self-interested individual that we referred to before, and importantly, acting of their own free will. And a quote from uh, Carol Pateman here, um, who wrote about the sexual contract, switching social to sexual. Social contract theory is conventionally presented as a story about freedom. One interpretation of the original contract is that inhabitants of the state of nature exchange the insecurities of natural freedom for equal civil freedom, which is protected by the state. So here we've got a contract that is supposedly consensual, um, but Pateman goes on to argue that this masks the power relation of domination and subordination that are intrinsic to the modern state modern liberal state and to capitalism, yeah. So what we're looking at here is something of a fiction, yeah. On Pateman and Mills, this is Charles Mills who wrote about the racial contract, took up the sexual contract by Pateman and focused on the race dimensions of the modern liberal state. Um, so together they write, the notion of the social contract is a political fiction that has justified the patriarchal racial and imperial structures that have shaped the modern world, leading to societies whose historical self-conception is so thoroughly and misleadingly informed by notions of individual freedom and equality. Yeah. So we are looking at the notion of the subject that this implies. Yeah. Um, so Foucault, his, his commentary here is uh, about this fiction yeah, so instead of asking ideal subjects, this is the individual, supposedly universalized subject, the rational, autonomous subject. Instead of asking those ideal subjects what part of themselves or what powers of their, theirs they have surrendered in entering into this social contract, one would need to ask how relations of subjectivation that are embedded within that social contract can manufacture subjects. So this is what we are looking at here. What kind of subject is produced within this notion of the social contract? Um, that notion of social contracts 
that the free autonomous agent signs up to um, is also a contract that pr produces exclusions. Um, that individual entering into the social contract is assumed to be rational and autonomous, yeah? But at the same time, not all individuals were regarded as capable of rational action, and they were excluded from the social contract and not recognized as liberal subjects, yeah? So two aspects to this, yeah? Women were regarded as the weaker sex, afflicted by their emotions, as Kant, the Enlightenment philosopher, put it, and incapable, therefore, of rational action. Yeah. So they were confined to the private sphere, uh, and this produced a gendered private-public divide. Um, so assumptions of the severity of Western civilization that were also embedded in this uh, modern imaginary of society um, and of its man of means, the rational, individually sovereign, Western, white and heterosexual um, subject imposed a hierarchy of humanity that was racialized. Yeah. So what we've got here is the production and installation of a gendered racialized class, et cetera, et cetera, difference that was also naturalized and rationalized by the development of modern science um, and what has been called uh, social Darwinism. Yeah. Um, so here we have um, uh, by modern science, a uh, commentary by uh, Pittman and Mills, uh, how at the time, this age of modernity, age of the Enlightenment, uh, accounts of differences between groups of people and between men and women began to be developed in the 17th and 18th centuries, together with theories about the stages of civilization. Some civilizations are advanced, others are backward. Theorists of an original social contract played an important part in the emergence of modern ideas about racial and sexual differences and hierarchies, albeit that their theories were couched in the subversive language of universal freedom and equality. Yeah, That's the supposed premise of this social contract. And what we're highlighting is how this masks relations of subordination and domination and produces these hierarchies um, of humanity. Um, so here we're going to turn now to what we said before about the development of uh, modern science that was also intrinsic to the age of modernity uh, and how this contributed uh, to these, um, uh, these hierarchies. Okay, so we've now got a situation if we're reading back from those times of what who the liberal subject is, who's included and who's excluded. And what's important here is the use of modern science in order to sediment those social hierarchies. Um, so the, the development of modern science was actually there to support the superiority of Western man. Its emphasis on quantification naturalizes and normalizes difference, which opens the door for objectification and hierarchical comparison. Its supposed universalism, in other words, every category is the same, uh, emergent from scientific rationality, dislocate the subject from the context of its production. When we see, for example, we'll go into it later, when you see a gendered number, a number about gender, you're not actually locating that subject in the context where that, that data is coming from. Um, it reinstalls the liberal subject and it's excluded others, the excluded others of gender, race, class, plus, plus, plus. Um, and indeed, Immanuel Kant, the famous, infamous Enlightenment philosopher, was one of the first to develop a concept of race that he claimed to have a scientific status. Um, yeah. um, and so here we can see uh, texts that uh, describe because some of this science was to measure heads and brains and things like that. Uh, and what we have here is the Anglo-Teutonic, obviously the liberal subject, the perfect one. And then we have the Irish Iberian and uh, the Negro. And what, what this text underneath it is a little bit, a little bit small, and I would say this uh, uh, about Ireland, but it says that these Irish Iberians actually were some kind of Stone Age, low kind of people who intermarried with um, Iberians who came up through Spain, from Africa through Spain to Ireland. 
Um, and it's just, it's just interesting uh, to have low type of descendants of savages of the, of the Stone Age. Anyway, what this is showing is how science was made to produce distinctions and differences. And as Le Alan Lester, who is also at Sussex, says, everyday administration of the British Empire was completely saturated with racial difference. Um, okay, moving on, we now we now talked about liberalism producing hierarchies. And here we have hierarchies where liberal societies were assumed to represent an advanced stage of civilization, a superior way of organizing life, whose understandings had universal validity. Um, other societies were regarded as backward, in need of civilization, which will be achieved over time following the trajectories of, of the West development. So we can see here um, representing an idea of a the development tra trajectory, a linear development trajectory in which uh, nations of the global south are supposed to emulate the economic development of uh, those in the north. Um, and so what this does is um, intrinsic this, to this where modern ideals of linear progress is justified colonialism and remained installed in contemporary hierarchies of development. This masks capitalist exploitation and the injustice of colonialism in the name of civilization, in the name of development. So if we go back to the development hierarchies, again, you're not supposed to read what's on there. You might have had reference, might have referenced them if you were looking at development in any way. What we see is that word hierarchy appearing again. And we have development measured by those indicators and used to produce hierarchies and to produce comparisons. And um, we've got uh, hierarchies, very high, high human and medium human development and low human development, that is a hierarchy. Within this, however, education has important um, significance. And for us, that is really important to look at what is the work of education. Um, but in this hierarchy, we just see the reiteration of Western superiority and the deficit in other countries. And often this hierarchy of low, very low human development is used as a rationale for development um, intervention. Let's turn to gender because this is, you know, we came in looking at gender, but giving you the background to this. Again, we've got um, a gender hierarchy. Uh, gender in the statistics was just added to development statistics. It didn't do much else, it just did a little bit of disaggregation. It produces a gender binary. We've got male and female, we don't have anything else. We don't have any contours of what it is to be that. Um, because it, what it does is it naturalizes and universalizes gender. It flattens the difference between sex, gender, and sexuality. And if you like, when we're looking at statistics, we are looking at outcomes. We're looking at reports that are outcomes, stats that tell us about outcomes. They don't tell us or they ignore the gender social processes through which the outcomes are achieved, are produced. What goes on to produce these gender outcomes? Uh, so it's a decontextualization. Clearly there are um, important absences here um, because we've got statistics that work to objectify and homogenize these dynamics of diverse social contexts through a, these uh, and homogenize dynamics of diverse social contexts through a Western imaginary. So it's the Western gaze that objectifies and homogenizes, makes silent the dynamics of local social relations. And here with a quote from Ayumi, interests, concerns, predilections, neuroses, prejudices, social institutions and social categories of Euro-Americans have dominated the writing of human history. Indeed, male gender privilege as an essential part of European ethos is enshrined in the culture of modernity. 
So what we see is an invisibilization of the social relations and processes that produce the subject, that produce identities. And we see this invisibilization if aspects of that are not counted. Um, and again, turning to Mouffe, Mouffe says, liberalism constructed modern citizenism, citizenship in the realm of the public, which was identified with men, excluding women who are confined to the private or the domestic realm. We might see, for example, participation in the labour force, but when we're talking about participation in the labour force, we may have the report of it by males and females. We don't have any sense of the labour that takes place in the private realm. Um, okay, and so now actually quoting myself, how wonderful. Um, what we're looking at here is how this kind of measurement, development and its measurements are a technology of power and they produce a misrecognition of gender. The use of fixed dimorphic gender categories together with a focus on outcomes <laughs> is a form of objectification that, in treating one gender type subject as undifferentiated from another, in other words, a female here and a female there, undifferentiated from the other, it thus sustains a misrecognition of being and becoming gendered through an alienated cognition that looks at the world through the categories the world imposes and appre apprehends the social world as the natural world. In other words, we've taken up some of these categories and we've used them to look back at what we think is the natural world without looking back, without considering how these very categories and their outcomes are measured and reported. <laughs> Can I give you this? That's a badge of honor. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So moving on um, after that excavation of liberalism and its um, implications for development and for gender, um, we want to turn to look at some very recent uh, texts emanating from international organizations such as UNESCO. Um, and our argument is that these texts are saturated with a liberal lexicon, yeah? Um, so we highlighted earlier the notion of stadial progress, different stages of civilization that are part of the notion of modernity. Um, and um, here we see it's one example out of hundreds that come out of um, GEM reports and so on, an emphasis um, uh, on the notion of progress itself. So deepening the, the debate, this is about um, extending access to education. It involves looking beyond access, completion and learning uh, to societal norms, influencing progress. That notion of progress is absolutely central to um, all of these big reports. We also see how these reports construct, systematically construct hierarchies that involve deficit and they also naturalize gender differences around a male and female uh, binary. Uh, so a quote here from UNESCO uh, 2023, uh, over the past 20 years, gender disparities in education have changed rapidly with girls closing or even reversing the gaps that separated them from boys in access completion learning at various education level. Um, so here we see writ large, yeah, reinstalling uh, that diamorphic understanding of gender uh, that Marie wrote about um, uh, and quoted uh, earlier, but also that notion of a gap, the deficit, um, and um, uh, a kind of construction of deficit. We highlighted also how the modern age um, supposed uh, was premised on a strong notions of individual agency and the notion of freedom. That individual entering into the social contract was doing it of their own free will as an autonomous subject, autonomous rational subject. And here we have um, saturated through this kind of uh, these kind of reports uh, notions of agency and freedom recurrently invoked. So human development report now advancing human development 
I mean, we could take up the notion of development itself here, but means pursuing all aspects of capabilities, well-being and agency, achievements and freedoms. So this kind of lexicon recurs and recurs. And again, in the same report, freedoms and agency have always been intrinsically important, also intrinsically important as facilitating collective action to provide public goods. So here in that little bit, we've got a reference to the social contract, the individual and um, uh, the, uh, the individual uh, acting of their own uh, uh, free will, engaging in collective action and engaging, um, uh, uh, doing this to provide public goods. Um, but yes, and then uh, also the notion of, again, the aspirational space here, um, this is about notions of progress and development as well. Um, so um, another issue in the, these texts is the recurrent reference to individual rights, um, to the relation, uh, the states and the social contract. Um, so uh, a quote from UNESCO, governments differ in the extent to which they provide sufficient financing for education as a means of respecting, protecting, and fulfilling the right to education. Um, this right encompasses both entitlements and freedoms. And again, the stress on individuals having the right to free and compulsory education. This language seems benign and positive, uh, but what we're arguing is that it's saturated with liberal assumptions of that free individual, yeah, um, and assumes a particular relationship of rights and responsibilities um, to um, the state um, and effectively is invoking a notion of a social contract. So that social contract that we critiqued uh, earlier on, yeah, that relationship of the individual to the state, to society is writ large here in this assumed in this text. Yeah. We also must bear, well, must recognize um, that this notion of rights has been strongly critiqued for its liberal assumptions and the work it does in positioning the subject. Yeah, it's assumed to be benign, this emphasis on rights. It's writ large through all of the uh, United uh, Nations texts, of course, um, with the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, of course, from 1948. Um, but Kapoor here comments that these human rights engagements constitute and inscribe the subject into specific ways of being free, yeah? ways that are aligned with a neoliberal, wealth-producing, heteronormative, reproductive framework, as well as with sexual, cultural, racial, and religious prescriptions. So this is not neutral, in other words, uh, and we need to be alert to the ways these discourses are framing the production of particular citizens and subjects. Yeah, um, there we are. So I'm passing back for a final yeah, time. Yeah, okay. There we are. Um, We've only got a couple more slides to go. So rounding off to say, what have we been talking about today? Um, and you can imagine that this talking about it to you today has been based on long hours of arguing about this over time. So um, so what are we going to talk about? I think what we're trying to say is that liberalism is a taking for granted common sense foundation of development. It is assumed as a superior way of organising society in, in ways that install hierarchies of difference and that are reproduced by education for us people interested in education, education, that is really important, that they are reproduced by education. It's foundational concepts. And you will, these words will ring if you've read anything from uh, international agencies about autonomy, about agency, about freedom, about science and rationality, about individualism. They are integral to the liberal subject as a rational, autonomous agent. This framing of the individual agent in this way, the subject in this way, produces multiple exclusions by gender, race, class, plus, plus. 
It continues, however, to legitimate the civilizing mission of empowerment, that empowerment word writ large against gender in particular, but also other things. It reflects a possessive understanding of power. I have power, you don't have power, I can give power. And an individual, individualized and dislocated sense of agency, as if agency was free floating somewhere and not working within the context, within the specific context. Um, and all of this, all of these understandings of liberalism, all of these ideas of liberalism that underpin that informed development, open the door to neoliberalism and the responsabilization of the individual subject. And we can see over time how, how individual subjects have become responsible for whatever, for everything actually, especially if they work here. But no, that's a different story. <laughs> Um, so what the te test is, if we're looking, if we're looking at liberalism and development and we're saying these things, what we now need to do is deconstruct that nexus of liberalism, gender and development, which is where we started. So it's clear that we need a new language for thinking about the subject. We need to attend to the ways that social institutions, school, religion, family, legal system, workplaces, produce the subject. We need to recognize the interplay of social, historical, and political contexts in the production of identities. We actually need to develop a new lexicon, a new way of speaking, in order to disrupt the common sense, the taken for granted, the common sense languages that constantly reinstall the liberal subject and its hierarchies of difference, including gender, race, class hierarchies, plus plus. And importantly here, we are social science researchers. We need to take those new understandings into our research methodologies. It means something different. We haven't got this um, isolated autonomous individual there. We're all people with our different places. So, Reshaping the nexus, we'll finish with this, um, with this slide. We want to open spaces for alternative ontologies and epistemologies. And as Saito et al say, the foundations of modern science, religion, and the global capitalist economy function to displace other ways of knowing, being, and acting, rooted in alternative collective base based cosmological and spiritual ontologies and epistemologies, and we need to get to that. We need to engage with that. So in terms of not only the substantive issues, but also our research issues, how we research, what we research in what ways. I would say the mass has ended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marie and Barbara, for that incredibly productive and powerful critique of uh, liberalism, of liberal thought and assumptions, and how these assumptions are intensely gendered and the grave implications they carry for um, international development, something that's of interest and relevance to people in the room here. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a Sussex buzz for five minutes. We're going to turn to someone next to us and buzz, reflect on the lecture, some of the questions that arise, that emerge for you from the presentations. And um, we're gonna bring those back to the room. We will collect a few of those questions, um, a few in person, a few online. Uh, people online, they're posting their questions in the, in the chat function. Okay, so they're doing that and um, I should have said there's a closed caption facility that's, that, that is available on Zoom. It's five minutes of buzz and they were coming back to the room with questions for the presenters. Thank you. Thank you.
There's quite a long question here. <laughs> There's one here. I'll read, I'll read these out. Here. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're we're coming back. We're coming back to the room. We're coming back to the room with those. With those buzzing, with those questions, those pressing questions and reflections that we have for those two presenters there. Um, should we take a few questions from you? There's a lot of buzzing. We've got a mic. Virgil has a question, and then there's a question at the back. <clears throat> Thank you, Mairead and uh, Barbara. This was excellent, um, and it was a great presentation. You really um, laid the foundation of um, 
to what I would say historical trajectory of the neoliberalism in connection with development and gender as a discourse. Um, but we were kind of discussing here about uh, how um, you talked about some of these discourses has been totalizing and kind of um, uh, thinking development as a linear process. But uh, we, I, I couldn't help but think that the proposal that you're making or the discussions that you're making here in terms of neoliberalism um, or liberalism and neoliberalism and, and the way that this uh, development has been described as if it's a smooth problem-free process and, and, and totalizing in many ways in parts of the world uh, uh, has been done in a linear way. And we were wondering about the ruptures. We were wondering about the temporalities and special uh, reconfiguration of the times. And, and in that sense, we want to know, you know, what is, what are, what were the ruptures or what are the ruptures that problematizing that linear notion of liberalism? And, and I think that's really important because the importance of the struggles that have gone through to um, against this neoliberal or liberal um, uh, discourse uh, should be highlighted. And so as well, the historical development of the liberalism over in time and space and through time and space. And I think this is, this is crucial. And the second important question, and I thought, what would be the relationship between the li liberalism as a discourse uh, in, con in conjunction with the capitalism, not capitalism as the um, economic system, but if we think about capitalism as a form of life. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this great presentation. I think uh, I just had a question that bounces uh, on the, the previous one, which is about um, this origins of contemporary neoliberal thinking, which is prevalent within the field of development. And, you know, thinking about the origins of it, it's, again, it's not like a linear, you know, process in a sense. And if we think, for example, about UNESCO or the UN agencies in the 1950s and 60s, when they were set up, uh, communist or socialist thought was also powerful and embedded ideas of collectivism and all that. Or, you know, Catholic left traditions, for example, also had spiritual spiritual conceptions of life uh so they weren't necessarily individualistic uh from the onset so i, I wanted uh, to ask if you could say something about you know those other traditions and also those ruptures um which also made their way within that thought uh, we can think about uh, non-alignment for example and the critique of non-alignment uh so yeah that's i think uh, there are a few questions online, so I would like to take one online and then we could. So there's one around practicalities and setting out of policy. And um, Maria is asking about the UN documents as development goals and how by looking at the outcome, by looking at the reports, um, do you not then ignore the struggle of different actors with different values influencing the production of those documents? And second, what alternative values and words would you like to see in those documents? example, instead of the binary, or um, if women and girls are so disadvantaged in many societies, was talking about women in all their diversity, not mean that it takes away momentum for advocacy around their disadvantages. So that's a question. Um, should we want to take it? Or should we stop here? And then... No, we can, we can take those. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I'm assuming people can hear from this microphone. Well, it's on, but you know, they, if they can, it's okay. It's yeah. Like, fine. Um, yeah, I think those questions about ruptures and about different regimes of truth, if you like, um, that and, and certainly religion is is really important um, set of ideals that are put in place that either go alongside capitalism or, or not, and it depends when you're talking about. Them. So I think our our description, if you like is to trace 
how the dominant discourses of development leave those things untouched. And much of the, the macro global discussion doesn't go anywhere near that. And so our, our point, I think, mm -hmm. is to say, this is not only a substantive issue, it's a methodological question. And so it's a question in which we have to explore. When all these data are sent out, we're right at the macro level. And we know actually that, you know, the claimed truth of that, of that data is also got a big question mark on it as well. You know, the 75%, as I would quote, fantastic 75 percent but what does it mean and where has that number come from and even those comparisons of gaps the gaps who's making up the gaps uh and you know um that comparison of how girls do in comparison to boys when boys are taken as the norm and girls are either you know 0.9 or 0.6 related to the norm of the boys or 1.2 or whatever, whatever. But what it does is it, it imposes categorizations and directions to what countries do. And indeed, what countries might have to appeal to, because if they're severely impoverished, uh, they have to do something. They have to take some of these dis dominant discourses and respond. So let me just say that I don't I, I acknowledge both the things that you're saying and we're going to say, but I think we're trying to say, think about this dominant discourse and understand how it has been produced. This is not common sense. It should not be made normative. It is about saying, oh, hang on a minute. When you're talking in that way, you're taking with your language racialized, gendered expressions that differentiate and make the world hierarchical. And you're doing it at the big level. We, you, we don't even know what's going on. I mean, luckily, I think for both Barbara and I, we work with students who come from different places, who are actually exploring those different places, trying to use different kinds of methodologies to explore their own place, to bring into being, into, into word, uh, into text, what's going on. And it's through that that we can start to compete with some of these linear categorical ideas. So, Barbara, I talked for a long time. You go for it. No, no, uh, just to, um, uh, in response to both of those questions, I was thinking actually your questions align with our arguments, mm. uh, which are about attention to context mm. and the histories of those contexts, the complexities of their differences, um, and um, the the ways that yeah their their values their societies uh, may not uh, be uh, will be different from those that of the uh, sit not align well with those that are uh, framed and portrayed in the dominant discourses. Uh, so I was just thinking, actually, yeah, we agree with you. You know, <laughs> we need to attend to that, and that's part of what we're arguing for: uh, attention to those differences, uh, attention uh, to their to the struggles, as you said. Um, so it's, um, yeah, thank you for, for both both comments. Uh, when we're talking about the production of the subject, all subjects have a history. You know, it's not uh, our identities. If you think of, you know, Bourdieu's notion of habitus, for example, uh, the, dis the sedimentation of dispositions within particular fields over time. Over time. Um, that is not something that happens overnight. It is a product of the histories of different contexts. As just one illustration of how you could think of that. Um, uh, you know, Butler's repeated stylization of acts in terms of the production of, of gender. Those, those repetitions, the sedimentation of these things, um, means that we do need to attend to the histories of different contexts um, and the, the, the values, the etc., of those contexts too. So I think we would agree with what you're, yeah. you're, you're saying yeah, and highlighting. We should perhaps turn to the last question that came from online, which we haven't addressed properly. No, uh, question it's about, about uh, practicality. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there is that big emphasis and push to do something. And it's good to stand back and say, what are we doing when we're doing something? And lots of the funding for the doing something comes from big international organizations, maybe sometimes 
national governments, not so much. But maybe the the question is about asking instead of going ahead and saying, this is what we do for gender equality. We want to empower people. What does that mean? What does it mean? You know, maybe the question of practicality is one that we need to reflect on. I mean, we all want to do things. We, uh, and a simple example inside education, we need to think about how the institutions work to produce the conditions in which uh, subjectivities are formed, how they are formed and how they are differentiated. I mean, we know, for example, that if you want to get an A plus in my class, you have to be nice to me and bring me back. <laughs> but, you know, and so we treat these things as, as an objective and out there. But actually something goes on, something that is going on, and education is key to this. And this provokes us to say, what is that institution doing to disrupt some of these uh, common sense acceptance of categories? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are questions there. Ali, Namze, there's a question there, and then Rebecca. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little a little bit about the agonism that might come along with reshaping this lexicon. Um, because for example, it might be commonsensical to think about um equity as a great thing. Um, but at the same time, for example, religious narratives might not be able to reproduce um that equity but they're still very important and they're still held very closely by large populations that you might not want to impose um, that sort of narrative on. So again, how do you go about that agony? How do you uh, navigate this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mairead. So my question is around um, the discourse and the framing of development, education, uh, new liberalism, and it's how it can influence practical everyday lives of people who are not privileged like us mm -hmm. to sit in a room with you and listen to discourses like this. Because uh, I know in the last few days I've had some conversations with people back home, and like you said, that education frames or uh, creates distinction of differences and, and forms a people. And when you tell them that, okay, uh, what you're doing, yeah, you're, you're not going on, on your real path. And they, they feel that, no, they're, look, they're looking towards the part of um, a westernized part as the best option. So somebody was talking of um, wanting me to help them do an educational project. And he says, he's trying to get the kids away from planting cuckoo and come and learn mathematics and English in the classroom, that they are wasting their time every day going to the farm. Instead, they should come to the classroom and learn. So maybe like some years back, I would have agreed with him. But now with what I've learned, I'm, I told him, no, let them continue with their farming and that the farming, the, what they're doing on the farms, practically, is more relevant for them than just going to a classroom to go and learn something that might not be able to put food on their table. So how do you, how do you bridge these gaps between uh, the practical realities of what people are facing and these theories that uh, we are learning. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I suppose what I'm thinking about too links to what, what, you, what you've been saying. Well, uh, th thank you very much, both of you, by the way. Really in enjoyed that. Um, uh, we're, we're sitting in this room produced through liberalism and neoliberalism and uncomfortable it feels too. And uh, that, that sort of sense of uh, painful too, as you, you indicate to us. But um, that sort of sense of, yeah, well, actually, everybody would like a bit of it. <laughs> um, and so it, the, the sort of almost how do we sort of counter that elitist discourse that says, well, um, actually, sorry, we did it all wrong for you. Uh, and it, it needs to be done differently and we'll write some nice sort of texts for you. We'll reconstruct the we, we'll, um, and I'm um, so, sorry about the discourse. Sorry, it's an enormous question. So, um, yeah. We'll take those, 
Sorry. Yeah, no, great. Good. So, Ali, thank you very much for the question about agonism uh, and relating that to religion. Um, uh, there is a particular, uh, what we were trying to highlight uh, in our uh, presentation um, is actually that, although that notion of a social contract poses consent, which flattens agonism, agonism is actually intrinsic uh, to the liberal subject, uh, the production of the liberal subject. Um, so um, in drawing by or Mood, for example, that is a, a theorist, post structural theorist who uh, would highlight agonism as intrinsic and, and difference uh, to um, the production of identities and uh, the subject. Um, the ways that religion has been um, framed in liberalism is that that has been left outside of the uh, civil. There's supposedly there's a premise of secularism uh, that is associated with liberalism, um, which is really problematic, actually, um, given that many um, uh, advanced, in quotes, democracies um, are fueled by fundamental, you know, I think of the states and the way the fundamental Christianity infuses the discourses of Trump, for example. Mm. Um, so the supposed separation of the state and religion is deeply problematic. Um, uh, but the, the tension of these values, um, I suppose, is something that we uh, simply, you cannot develop programs to address that. You know, It's not as if you can um, suddenly um, at a macro level, um, dictate what needs to be done about those things. Our argument is to be attend to the local divisions, local social contexts, and that you know, in terms of research, to understand those differences, we sh should move beyond that macro level focus to understand how local, uh, how those differences are produced at a, a more local level. So the, the local social relations through which that is produced and the histories are really, really important. Um, but that gets completely flattened in that macro level discourse. Um, so we recognize those things are important, uh, say they do need attention, but they need attention at a, a, a more contextualized, um, that's our emphasis in terms of uh, the end, in terms of research methodologies, um, not just an imposition of categories, these are Muslims, these are Christians, what, you know, our last research in northern Nigeria explored uh, young women's understanding of work and education in, in Muslim and Christian uh, contexts, mm -hmm. but we are listening to the voices of those women in their context and the dynamics uh, that, pr that whatever hierarchies that might involve, um, rather than uh, assuming uh, particular um, that Islam needs this, that Christianity means that. Um, so it is about being much more attention to the local. Um, um, yeah, and in, in terms of, yeah, Namzi, your question about education and the way it's looked to um, as, yeah, there is something there as, you know, the, the bright future that education can bring, yeah? Um, and actually, there are so many problems with education. You know, even the even the supposition that um, to be working in a field, um, you're actually much better in school. It depends so much on the quality of education in the school. Schooling is assumed to be benign. Um, in fact, uh, when I think of your work in uh, research on the production of uh, identities in schooling in Ghana and Botswana. Um, there's there's a lot of schooling that is not benign, uh, and you know schooling itself. We addressed development um, and education in a large way. When you look at the uh, the day to day practices of schooling, um, we could also find traces of those liberal discourses. Um, in fact, uh, so the very assumption that education is necessarily benign. Um, is, uh, I would say, slightly problematic. Uh, and um, we highlighted how education is just looked to as a vector and indicator of progress. Yeah. Um, 
there is something that is, yeah, um, there that we want to critique as well. Yeah. And Murray. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, I think it, those questions you're raising, the one of religion is really important. I just want you to know, let you know that I'm a good Catholic girl. Mm -hmm. And this is a terrible Protestant. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, <laughs> See, violence. <laughs> um, but, you know, and that, that agonism, even in what might seem to be an advanced liberal uh, part of the world, is sustained and retained and lived. Um, so it is a big issue. And it's a big issue in the sense that lots of people who want to construct hierarchies and make difference and cleave populations for political purposes, utilize religion in this way. Um, and also for you, Nancy, this thing about the dilemmas, you know, go to the field or stay in school when there's nothing going on in school. Um, they're, they're big dilemmas and it happens in lots of places because there's a, an encouragement to engage in the competition, a competition that you're going to lose but nevertheless to engage in that competition in some way. So maybe we have to think around that. After all, the format of schooling over the, over the globe looks practically the same. It is a vestige of ancient life in Northern Europe where only boys and uh, people going to be priests were educated. And that same model lives on, helped by people like Piaget. What can I say? Um, but uh, so th there's difficulties there. And so that leads us to the question Rebecca is, is raising. And, you know, if even if we are in this privileged place, we're in this privileged place to ask questions and to critique and to voice that critique and try to not just accept, you know, just the next set of development goals that are going to come from somewhere. I mean, at least we can say in the last development goals, they included the globe. The ones before were referenced to the global south. Um, but it's our responsibility. And it's, it's not for me to say what goes on in Pakistan or Nigeria or wherever, mm -hmm. in China, wherever. It is for us to try and understand and support Support what it, what people think is good, and that you know this is this is very local. I'm just thinking of uh, researchers that we have who are looking at comprehensive sexuality education in Zambia, looking at how the formal text of the school says one thing, produces this thing of a a white wedding, whereas if you talk to local people, that's absolutely not. What, how they understand ideas of marriage, childbirth, or sexual relations at all. So they will just stand apart from each other if we don't do the work of trying to inform some of these big ideas with multiple different perspectives on those things. And, it, you know, it's, I think that's our work. Not to sit here and be happy that we're sitting in a nice blue seat, but we're yellow, but, you know, <laughs> not to do that and have a little chat. Um, it, that's our responsibility. We're in an academic institution. We are social science researchers. It's our responsibility to critique some of those dominant ideas that we don't even think about. We take them for granted. Not our conditions, but that is the way that we talk about life and people, and especially other people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop there, Mary. Okay. Um, we have about 10 more minutes and a few more questions online. Yeah. I'm going to take those. There's people asking for suggestions for their dissertation projects. Um, <laughs> so there's uh, Erica saying that I'm in the process of finishing my dissertation and I'm critiquing the neoliberal, the idea of empowerment rhetoric as mm -hmm. applied to Kenya's coffee sector. Mm -hmm. uh, my challenge is in making this case, so many of my research participants are focused on neoliberal solutions based on markets and finance as yeah. the answer, although they do not identify this as neoliberal. Yeah. Would you see this as an example of the saturation of neoliberalism? Um, any advice is welcome. 
Tareen is asking who gets to decide who invents this language, this dominant language. And then we have Ashley asking, how do we change the paradigm of Western empowerment? What can the global South do now to change hundreds of years of misconceptions when the global South are still portrayed as the poor child that needs help? Mm -hmm. There's one more question. Thank you very much for the lecture. It's really fascinating. I have a question which sort of follows on from you saying that uh, school isn't necessarily benign. I was thinking, because I've been reading uh, Ivan Illich recently, how does your analysis align or not align with that sort of libertarian thinking around de-schooling and subjugation within education systems and pupils being kind of factory fodder for the capitalist system? It would be really interesting to hear your reflections on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, um, I think what we tried to do today was try to make visible some of those things that are taken for granted about who is the liberal subject, how this uh, constructs the notion of who we are or who other people are, and what that means about interrelations, and then what it means about what kind of education the kind of education we have. Um, so for those people who are trying to do their dissertations, I think what they're trying to do is make visible, looking at, it's, people say language, but when we're using the word language, we're really talking about discourse. And discourse isn't only about the words you speak, it's about the actions that come from it. These are all part of discourse. and. Um, that's important to recognise, but because it means about doing things, it means about being things, um, and uh, I think we can start with language. You could, like, we tried to look at some of the international agencies' um, texts and indicate through a textual analysis, kind of, the way that what they were saying was full of words that describe individualism, even agency separated from structure or context. We try to draw out those things about hierarchy and how that hierarchy that we've given a particular historical background to is sustained. And some of these meanings of the text, even if they want to be more innocent, actually carry, carry those meanings with them. And it's those things that we have to be attentive to, we have to think about. Um, so, of course, Ivan Illich, <laughs> de-schooling society is very attractive because we are in a factory kind of thing where there is only one way to do schooling and it, it's supposed to do things for individuals and societies, and indeed it has. And, and we can talk from a country which has a has a a high, a high cost private sector. And people who go to that, those schools are often the people who end up making the policies that affect all of us. So, you know, we are in the position of trying to disrupt. Um, I'm not sure if it is de-schooling society because I think that's a tall order, but it is to be more conscious of what meanings we are carrying with us and to be able to understand, reflect, and disrupt some of those common sense language, things that we take for granted. Sorry, I stopped talking about the other day. The question about who decides about the language. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Ali, you've highlighted agonism, and this is going to be an agonistic, it's be a struggle for the field, mm. uh, absolutely. But you know what we can contribute is just the, this kind of debate, this language is not adequate to think mm. about the work of education. Um, this notion of yeah, you of empowerment is not adequate to think of um, the struggles uh, in um, in a classroom uh, and what that is, uh, what that involves. Um, so yeah, it, that will be actually a struggle, uh, an agonistic struggle about what kinds of language uh, that we might use. But what we are drawing on are theoreticians that um, uh, emphasize difference, um, 
emphasize struggles for uh, for position um, and engage in those struggles. Uh, so those are the kind of things that um, uh, it's not for us to decide, um, but um, uh, that we, as academics, uh, we have uh, a strong sense uh, that we should be engaging in, yeah? To shift the field, shift the nexus, change the discourse, uh, offer something that is uh, critical of the dominant discourses, um, uh, rather than just seeing them reproduce and reproduce uh, the same flat um, uh, and inattentive uh, um, lexicon, uh, the, the inattentive to the hierarchies that are implicit within it. Yeah. It's it's some we highlighted the notion of invisibilization uh, of these categories, mm -hmm. uh, the way this this language masks relations of domination and sort of uh, So attention to power relations, attention to the work of education in reproducing inequalities uh, as opposed to empowering particular individuals. Um, changing the discourse, it will be a struggle. Uh, but yeah, it's part of what we're doing, we're trying to do. We have about five more minutes. There's a couple more questions online. Would you like to take them? Um, they're about practicalities. <laughs> of course, we um, take them. There is there's someone asking about um, suggestions on authors who explore the production of subjects through the development discourse, if you could signpost them. And then there's another question um, asking about your own empirical research in development, in context of development, taking a practical example of operational development on the work that you've done using the critique of neoliberalism and if you could illuminate some of the challenges of the work, of the empirical work that you've done, um, and how you operationalize the alternative to discuss these challenges. Okay. Uh, well, um, was that another question? Okay. We'll take that one, then we'll, we'll finish up yeah. with those. Okay. Hello, Professor. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, one of the good things about uh, listening to your lectures is that suddenly out of nowhere you're like oh now things make sense whatever has been going on oh this yes. connects uh, so right now uh, I'm training to be a teacher a science teacher a secondary school science teacher so um, I'm, I'm from India so I'm coming from a completely different mm -hmm. form of schooling system and right now I'm training in a completely different form of schooling system and uh, uh, so whenever I can, I can see as to how the individual is being produced in the school mm -hmm. because uh, I'm coming from a different system. Yeah. So I can see, oh, this is how you are giving a lot of voice to the child in class. And uh, my colleagues will be like, okay, this is, this is how we do it. So this is the normal. This is how, and they assume that this is how it, things done in other parts of the world too. Um, and uh, liberalist, liberal, liberalism make sense to me as, as to how a uh, individual subject with rational self-regulation, all these things. Th these words are repeatedly used in school, especially if you look at the vision, mission statements, resilience, yeah. uh, high, higher order words, not empowerment. We have less than a minute. Okay, so so uh, uh, recently, what happened is that right now there is more of a um, change in behavior management policy, which is kind of informed by therapeutic form of behavior management. And uh, I kind of uh, we were asked to look into the practices, but I kind of looked into the theory of it, and and I there is something that stuck me. It says that positive emotions lead to positive behavior and negative emotions lead to negative behavior. So as teachers, we should try to give more positive experience to students in class. And that's, uh, uh, and I think that's really, that's because it's in line with the neoliberal thinking and creation of a more individualized student. And I want to know, is that connection correct? Is it right for me to make that? Okay, okay, just two minutes. Two minutes. Well, just quickly, I mean, um, about the research, 
Um, I've done lots of research in lots of countries that are not my own, including this one, um, but in lots of different places. But when I've done that research, I'm always working with people from those places. So I'm always working in teams. Um, and that means that within the team, you're learning and researching at the same time, always. Um, so my approaches to research are that, because that's how you get, even if you get a privileged class national, wherever it is, they are still articulating something mm -hmm. that is of the, is it the zeitgeist of that place, of the feeling of that place? They're still saying something. And what makes it interesting is exactly that thing. As an outsider, you can sometimes see things that an insider just takes for granted. So um, your case there, AJ, is, is interesting because it's a lot of challenges. I can't say whether you're correct or not. I need more information. But um, so for those people who are online trying to do research, I think uh, we need to take care to look at institutions. I mean, if we're talking about gender, there's ways in which the gender positioning and actually the racial racialized positioning of people within institutions comes with assumptions. I mean, are people coming to me thinking that I can be a mummy to somebody? Well, forget it. You know, you know, people, because I'm a female, they want me to do certain things and they don't want me to do others. And the same occurs for males. They're taken into places and they're positioned according to how somebody looks at them and assesses what they would be likely to do. Um, so when we can think through those, when we can think through the obviousness of how institutions are arranged, uh, I think we're onto a winner. We can now reflect uh, and theorize. Do you want to add to that, Robin? Yeah, no, I mean, just attention to local social relations uh, and awareness of, um, yeah, when I think of the research we did um, with partners in Nigeria, South Africa, um, there was the, the work with the local researchers was absolutely intrinsic to that, uh, to the knowledge that was produced. Uh, we could not have. As there's no way I could have gone there to do that research. Uh, but yeah, we are learning from our local partners uh, all the time. Um, so that's that's really important. I think we're trying to speak back. Yeah. We're kind of trying to speak back to the assumptions that are made about how mm. and what you research. Mm. Uh, and that's important. Mm. Thank so, you. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, but and just in, in relation to the point of uh, positive emotions, um, I just want to return to the to the uh, uh, that notion of agonism is actually important as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, you know, we uh, actually when we are talking about things, we we got to recognise difference, um, and that we are not. There are going to be points of disagreement, and it's finding a way of accommodating those differences rather than assuming uh, flatness and similarity mm. um, that is so important. Mm. Um, so it's, I wouldn't, there is something about modern assumptions of the self that, um, that, you know, that actually produces a kind of idea of a therapeutic self as well. Um, and uh, that is, can be as totalizing as the assumption of the liberal subject to yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, attending to difference, um, uh, attending to each other uh, with respect, but yeah, the emphasis on positive emotions is something that I find a bit. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna keep this going. We're going to the ideas bar after. Yeah, that's where we're gonna keep this conversation alive. But um, for people online, there is lots of references, lots of authors and scholars that you've referred to. And they yes. could use that, your yes. presentation. So, yeah. The recording of this lecture will be available on the IDS website and email to all the attendees. So please do share this. Please do circulate um, the recording and the presentation. Um, we have the CRE Research Cafe tomorrow at 5 p.m., 5 to 6.30 in Essex House, 19. 19. Daniela Rubino presenting her research in Madagascar. So some of this 
will be continued there and we're going to the idea store after. So you're welcome. Thank you so much, Mairead and Barbara, for that incredibly powerful presentation. Looking forward to hear more on that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.